We've all seen the stories of F-117s defying air defenses to go straight to the heart of Iraq in Desert Storm. And more recently, we saw B-2 strike targets deep in Iran without any hint of real defense. Now it's obvious from these aircraft's unique shape that their form has something to do with their stealthy capabilities. But what is it exactly? That's the question I hope to answer in this video. So let's dive into how stealth works. Officially, the capability to evade enemy observation is known as low observability. And there are seven factors that contribute to low observability. The first three on this list are easily handled by just flying at night. EM emissions are controlled by either deactivating or using receive-only modes for radios, data links, radar altimeters, etc. And acoustics are mitigated by flying at an altitude high enough that the aircraft can't be easily heard from the ground. These are all things that could be done long before the first B-2 ever took flight. But it's these last two that require special engineering of the aircraft. So let's talk about what those features are. Infrared mitigation is accomplished by obscuring the view to the hottest part of an aircraft, its engine. Through the placement of engine intakes and exhausts in a place where it's blocked from view from below, IR sensors would not have a chance to see it. This placement gives the air enough time to mingle with cooler ambient air before it's in view. Of course, this limits an aircraft to flying at high and medium altitudes since there are airborne infrared sensors as well. But a more tricky problem to solve is radar reflection. In the earliest attempts at creating low observable aircraft, builders tried using radar absorbing material. One material that works to absorb radar waves is a type of paint that consists of a non-conductive substance with tiny particles of iron suspended within it. This was used on the SR-71, but it had limited success. It's not nearly as stealthy the way the B-2 is. Another approach uses conductive particles like crystalline graphite mixed with urethane to form a foam absorber. This is what the pyramids inside an anechoic chamber are made of. However, both of these approaches have a problem. They're limited to absorbing a small frequency range based on how they're created. So if you made a radar absorbing coating to counter high frequency fighter radars, then it wouldn't work against low frequency early warning radars. You can see it more easily in the foam absorbers used for test chambers. The longer pyramids work well against long wave radars, while the shorter ones work against short wave radars. This can present a problem for stealth fighters since they don't have the internal room to place absorbers that might need 60 centimeters or about 2 feet of depth for every part of the aircraft. While you will see radar absorbing materials applied to low observable aircraft like the F-117, it's not their primary source of low observability. That actually comes from their unique shape. So let's go over how that works. The best way to understand how shape affects observability is to look at how radar waves reflect off a surface. In the first video of this channel's radar series, we talked about how radar waves are generated. You can run an electrical current through a conductive surface and waves of electromagnetism will radiate out. Those same EM waves will charge any surface they come in contact with and cause a charge to run down them. That same charge running down a conductive surface will also generate EM waves. That's why highly conductive materials are more radar reflective. Now an interesting thing happens here. EM travels as a wave, so the radiated energy doesn't come out as a straight line. Unless it's shaped by something like a parabolic reflector, it radiates in every direction. But since it's not all coming out at the same time, we get this effect where the front of all these waves line up in a particular direction that mirrors the direction the original wave came in on. So anyone observing their reflection would get the strongest signal from here. There's a name for this phenomenon. It's called a specular reflection, and it's important for low observability. Now there is still some radiated energy going off on these other angles, and those reflections are known as diffuse reflections. However, they'll never be as strong as a specular reflection. As a designer of stealth aircraft, you would then know that if you can't control radar returns with absorbent material, then you would control it by directing the specular reflection away from the enemy radar emitter. This is very evident in the design of the world's first operational stealth interdictor, the F-117. Looking at it from the front, you can see that every surface is designed in a way to redirect the specular reflection away from an emitter in front of the aircraft. When the F-117 is flying towards a radar, that radar will only get diffuse reflections, which are very weak. We also see a similar profile when viewing the F-117 from the rear. But there's another feature that's not so obvious that's also contributing to low observability. It's a lack of corner reflectors. Let's go over what those are and why they needed to be removed. 
If you place two mirrors next to each other at a 90 degree angle, then you'll see an interesting effect. No matter where you go, you'll see your reflection in the middle where the two mirrors meet. At an angle of 90 degrees or less, light that enters will get sent back in the direction it came from. This is called the corner reflector, and since light is a form of EM, it means radar will behave exactly the same way. So any paired surfaces on an aircraft with a meeting angle of 90 degrees or less will send radar energy back to the emitter as if it was a specular reflection. So this space here on the F-15's tail is a huge corner reflector. The jet engine inlets and exhaust pipes on any jet are also huge corner reflectors. That's why we see the engine inlets on the F-117 covered with radar absorbent grills. And if we look at the exhaust, we see them reshaped from traditional pipes to these flat openings. These features cost the design some engine power, but the manufacturer felt it was worth the loss in power to eliminate the corner reflections from the engine. Those weren't the only corner reflections they removed. On most aircraft, the wing meets the fuselage near the middle of the aircraft. But on the F-117, we see the wing's leading edge go straight to the nose of the aircraft to avoid having a corner reflector. Now this is not an ideal aerodynamic design. Having the wing that far forward makes the aircraft unstable. But again, the designers thought the loss of stability was worth the gain in low observability. There's also another set of reflectors that's easily missed. The interior of the cockpit, including the pilot, can be a source of reflections. So special materials like golden fused alloy or indium tin oxide are used in the canopy. If you've ever seen a fighter with a gold tinted canopy, it's going to be this technology. What it does is reflect radar energy instead of letting it pass through. In other words, it turns a potential corner reflection from something inside the cockpit into a specular reflection away from the radar emitter. You'll often see the cumulative effect of all this engineering expressed as a radar cross-section, or RCS. This can be a little misleading, so I want to go over what it really means. The common way of expressing RCS is in meters squared. Now you might think this is how much surface area is exposed to radar on an aircraft, but that's not the case. Exposed surface area does play a part in this number, but this number is actually an expression of how much energy would be reflected from an imaginary perfectly conducting sphere of that size. Now technically it's about the part of the sphere that reflects back to the emitter. The top, sides, and bottom of the sphere wouldn't do that, so it would take an imaginary sphere that is 1.13 meters in diameter to have 1 meter squared of RCS. A human would be expected to have 1 meter squared of RCS. Small combat aircraft would be in the neighborhood of 2 to 3 meters squared. A cargo plane is somewhere around 100 meters squared. And a 1.5 meter corner reflector would have a RCS of around 20,000 meters squared. In other words, if you were operating a radar emitter, you would expect the radar return from that small corner reflector to be the same as if you pointed your radar at a sphere with 20,000 square meters of reflecting surface. Now you know why the F-117 builders were willing to give up performance and stability to get rid of corner reflectors. But this number by itself doesn't paint a complete picture. This is because the amount of reflection is going to change as the orientation of the aircraft changes with the radar emitter. For example, on our F-117, we won't see any specular reflections from the front. But as the F-117 flies past our radar emitter, it will expose the large flat surfaces of the stabilizers. These will have a higher RCS than all the angled surfaces that deflect emissions from the front. A more accurate depiction of an airframe's true RCS would look more like this polar plot. On here, we can see radar energy from this angle would reflect as if it was hitting an imaginary sphere with around 15 meters squared of RCS. But from this angle, that RCS jumps up to almost 30. So when this plane turns its side to a radar emitter, it'll be visible from a longer range. This is a top view 2D plot. For more accuracy, you would want additional plots showing how RCS is affected by angles above and below the horizon as well. This would give you a better idea of RCS in a three-dimensional world. Now what would all this look like for a stealth aircraft? Unfortunately, RCS plots for most military aircraft are not publicly available. But we are lucky enough to have one for the F-117, and it looks like this. Just like the design suggests, it is very low observable from the front and the rear. But from the sides, we see these spikes in RCS. This is going to come from the stabilizers providing a wide reflecting surface to emitters from the sides. But how exactly does this look in practice? Let's take a look at some examples. Radar returns are subject to the inverse square law, which I went over in this video. 
The short explanation is that the decrease in energy from returns doesn't fall off at a linear rate. In other words, the return from a target that's twice as far from an emitter is not half as strong. It's actually much weaker than that. Here's how that looks when it's plotted out. This represents a hypothetical aircraft with the RCS of 100 meters squared, so something like a big cargo plane. And against the hypothetical radar, we could expect the returns to look like this. Down here is the range in hundreds of kilometers. And here we have the energy we would expect to reach the radar system after it's reflected off our cargo plane from a particular angle. Now let's say this system needs at least two on the scale to see a target on the scope. This is going to be because every system has a certain amount of noise that clutters up results. So returns need to be above that noise floor. So under these conditions, we would expect to see this cargo plane when it's 700 kilometers or closer. But let's say we find a way to cut the cargo plane's RCS in half to 50. Would that mean it's visible at half the range? Not quite. Now the return crosses the two threshold here at 500 kilometers. That's still really far out from the radar site. To get to half the detection range, we need to bring down the RCS to 25, which is one quarter of our original RCS of 100. Now it's crossing the two threshold here at 350 kilometers. Again, it's not particularly close to the radar. So let's take it to an extreme and try a RCS of 0.01. Now we see that the radar gets a visible return here at just barely 10 kilometers. That's close enough for an aircraft to drop a standoff weapon like a JDAM or a JSAL without being detected. It's these extreme levels of low observability that are required to be truly stealthy. Once an aircraft gets this low in RCS, it is called very low observable, or VLO. But it's not just the average level of RCS that is important to consider, but how all these various RCS angles form a shape around the airframe. So let's take a look at one. This one's slightly different than the first 2D polar plot we looked at. The distance from the center does not represent RCS magnitude. Instead, it's the frequency of radar waves being used. So the inside of the circle is for lower frequencies, like early warning radar. And the outside is for higher frequencies, like what you would find in a fighter. I go over this in more detail on my radar intro video. This is all important because the size of the radar wave changes with the frequency. It has different effects based on the size and shape of the aircraft it's reflecting off of. So RCS will change with radar frequency. But what I want to point out here is that the F-117 is stealthiest from the front and rear. We see that by these dark blue areas here and here, where RCS is a tiny fraction of a meter. But out on the side, it goes above 6, which is what we'd expect from a large, non-stealthy fighter. That means the F-117 can safely approach or fly away from a radar. But when it's passing to the side, it'll appear like any other aircraft. This profile is known as a bowtie profile because when it's plotted out, it resembles a bowtie. When it comes to very low observable aircraft, there are two other profiles that are spelled out in this paper on low observability. One that focuses on RCS reduction from the front at the expense of all other directions is called the Pac-Man for obvious reasons. This is what you would expect from an aircraft where performance is a high priority along with stealth. So it would have prominent stabilizers and engine exhaust nozzles that are not protected from radar. These features would increase observability from the sides and rear. That's a cost the builders are willing to take for the added performance. Lastly, we have a profile which is low RCS from all directions. This one is called the fuzzball profile since most RCS plots are not perfectly round, but are a fuzzy line around the center. In this case, it'll be a much smaller circle than a non-stealthy aircraft. This type of aircraft would not have vertical stabilizers and its exhaust nozzles would be protected. This is what I would expect to see on the B-2 and the B-21. Aircraft in this profile most likely would not be supersonic or be very good in a dogfight. Each of these profiles presents a unique planning challenge to air crews taking them into hostile airspace. Let's take a look at what tactics would be used to overcome each profile's limitations. When a conventional aircraft enters an air defense network, the detection ranges of the defenses may look like this. But these areas change shape when a very low observable aircraft is involved. That shape is determined by the profile. So our bowtie profile aircraft would see an air defense network that looks like this, where detection range is higher to the sides, than the front and back, much like the bow tie itself. It can approach the radars in these areas without detection where a conventional aircraft would be picked up. So you might be thinking the obvious plan is to fly a path like this to avoid the radars. Unfortunately, that doesn't work. 
because as soon as our aircraft turns, it exposes its less stealthy sides to the radars. So with each turn of the aircraft, the detection profile of every radar also turns. And now our stealth aircraft finds itself vulnerable in the turns. To counter this effect, stealth aircraft commonly operate with other aircraft equipped with jamming equipment. The reason it's on other aircraft is that a jammer highlights its own position, which defeats the purpose of being very low observable. Here's what happens when a jammer is used. Let's say the side of our bow tie profile looks like this. At a noise floor of 2, that would mean the aircraft is visible here at 35 kilometers. But when a jammer is present, that floor moves up to 6. Now our stealth aircraft needs to get within 20 kilometers to become visible. That's an extra 15 kilometers of safety. When we look at this on our map, we would see the detection profile shrink with the aid of a jammer. Now there's a path through the defenses, even in the turns. But it's not as simple as that. If a single radar is suddenly jammed, it's an instant indicator that an attack is imminent. So the prudent thing to do is to have a jammer aircraft regularly jamming a number of sites in the area during combat operations. This way the defenses never know if it's routine jamming or cover for an attack. Stealth missions are a very large and coordinated operation. Messing up just one part of the operation can lead to disaster. We saw this happen on the night of March 27, 1999, when an F-117 was shot down over Serbia. There's an account of this incident written by Serbian air defense soldiers in this book, which helps explain why this happened. An F-117 with the call sign of Vega-31 was on its way home after dropping two laser-guided bombs on a target in Belgrade. Just to the west of Belgrade was the 3rd Battalion, 250th Air Defense Missile Brigade. Like all surviving air defense units in the war, it had been operating its radar sparingly and changing locations frequently to avoid NATO defense suppression. At 2040 hours, 4 minutes after Vega-31 left the target area, the 3rd Battalion turned on its P-18 surveillance radar. It found a contact, Vega-31, at a distance of 23 kilometers. This type of radar is low frequency, which is hard for the F-117 to counteract. However, it's also a low resolution, which means it's not suitable for accurately guiding a missile. This is why air defense sites often have a second higher frequency radar to guide missiles. And that's exactly what the SA-3 batteries of the 3rd Battalion used this night. They switched on the battery's SNR-125 radar and tried to track Vega-31 unsuccessfully at 17 kilometers. Then again at 15 kilometers before finally achieving a lock at 14 kilometers. It was at this point the F-117 was presenting its radar vulnerable side to the SA-3. Then at 2042 hours local time, Vega-31 was struck by one of the battery's rockets and shot down. After the incident, it was noted that Vega-31's planned jammer escorts had been reassigned to protect another mission, leaving it without ECM coverage. Had there been jamming available, the 3rd Battalion may not have gotten that lock on. It was a very sharp reminder of how critical every piece of a stealth mission is, not just the strike aircraft itself. I hope this helps to give a little insight into how stealth works, but just to be fully transparent, this is just scratching the surface of the topic. There's a lot of complex math that goes into designing a truly stealthy aircraft, and what I've shown in this video is an extremely simplified version of it. If you're interested in the real math behind stealth, there's a paper which was used by the F-117 engineers to perfect their final design. This paper came from an unlikely source, a physicist in the Soviet Union who had no idea that his work would end up creating the U.S. Air Force's first stealth strike aircraft. The U.S. Air Force has posted an English translation of this paper, which I'll link below if you'd like to read it. Unmanned aerial systems are also another topic I didn't go into in this video. These can be made much smaller than manned aircraft, and that means less surface areas for radars to work with. Small drones are inherently low observable just by being small. Lastly, there are emerging technologies in radar that can counter stealth, which can easily be an entire video all on their own. But I hope this video was enough to give you an understanding of how stealth works. So I'd like to say thanks for watching to the end, and I hope you learned something new about stealth.